All right, welcome back to another episode of the Complete Game Podcast. I'm your host, Casey Guerin, and today we're going to continue talking about our fantasy winners and losers from post-NFL draft, um, how each draft class affected certain veteran players fantasy-wise, whose stock improved, whose stock uh, was hurt by the NFL draft, and today we're going to talk about the AFC North Division. So just real fast, if you haven't caught our last two episodes from last week, um, please check out the AFC East post-NFL draft, fantasy winners and losers. Check out that division. And if you haven't, please go and listen to the podcast I did with CJ Gonzalez um, last week. Uh, I think I released that one on Saturday, talking about how he worked to where he got to. He's a pitcher for East Strasburg University. Uh, We talked a lot about working hard, trusting the process, uh, using your low points in your career and your athletic career to trampoline yourself and a a lot of really awesome things. Uh, CJ took the time out of his day to give us a lot of great information and give us a lot of personal information, and I think it could really help a lot of people. Um, We're getting some good feedback and some good reviews on that so far, so please go listen to that if you haven't. And please go listen to the AFC East post-NFL draft fantasy winners and losers. So today, AFC North, we're going to start it off with the Baltimore Ravens winners. It's going to be the same format as the last podcast. We're going to talk winners first for each team, and then we're going to talk losers for each team after that. So going into the Baltimore Ravens, um, their first big winner is Lamar Jackson. So why Lamar Jackson's a big winner from after the draft, uh, I think the Ravens had a pretty awesome draft Marshall Yanda they're all pro offensive guard retired and what they did what Baltimore did is go ahead and draft a lineman in the third round and a lineman in the fourth round to try and replace him so those guys can compete they plug that hole right away on the offensive line Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about the rookies that they took Uh, these two offensive linemen guys I've heard a lot of good things so they're going to plug that hole right away. The offensive line is going to be solid, just like last year. Lamar's going to have time to drop back and throw. He's going to have protection. Um, he might be able to run more. But uh, all in all, he's going to have more time to throw. And he, he's probably going to get even better as a passer with that good offensive line. So it's going to be good for Lamar Jackson to have that offensive line shirt up, to have that hole with all pro Marshall Yanda plugged right away. Um, they didn't wait. They they didn't try and stick somebody else in there. They they drafted two guys, two young, two young guys in the third and fourth round, and they're going to try and plug that hole right away. So another reason why Lamar Jackson is a huge winner from the draft is they drafted two receivers, Devin Duvernay from Texas. He runs a four three nine. He's really really fast, great speed. Um, he's a dynamic playmaker. Uh, his senior year at Texas, he had a hundred plus catches 1400 total yards uh, which is awesome that's a that's a big season which he did it as a senior so that it's got to be discounted he's not coming out early or anything uh, senior production is a little discounted just because you're older and it's your last year you're older than everybody else so seniors usually have great production in their last year um, that's why we look more towards uh, juniors coming out early to be fantasy studs uh, when it comes to the NFL draft. But Devin Duvernay has the speed. Um, he's sub 4-4, four, 4-3-9 four, four, speed. He has great speed. He he plays mostly slot, but that's just another extremely fast guy to put next to Hollywood Brown and Lamar Jackson in that offense. So next guy they added receiver was James Prochet from SMU. Prochet is more of a slot guy too. We don't have any testing numbers for him. But he did put up good stats at SMU. As a junior, he had 93 catches, 1,200 yards, 12 touchdowns. As a senior, 111 catches, 1,200 yards, 15 touchdowns. So he's he's a nice slot pass catcher, reliable option. And I think that'll help Lamar Jackson too, just to have some sort of reliable slot guy, some reliable check down while Duvernay and Hollywood Brown are out there stretching the field. Uh, making defenders trust the deep ball. It'll open up a lot underneath, possibly for Prochet. And Prochet's going to push rookie from last year, uh, now second-year guy, Miles Boykin, the third-rounder, who didn't have a great rookie season, so Prochet's going to push him a little bit. And Lamar Lamar gets 
<clears throat> excuse me, Lamar gets this offensive line fixed up real fast. He gets two new weapons, so he's a huge winner from the draft. Another winner, actually two winners that go together from the Baltimore Ravens are Mark Andrews and Nick Boyle. So former first-round draft pick Hayden Hurst, the tight end, got traded away to the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, they didn't draft any tight ends, and they didn't sign any significant tight ends in free agency. So Mark Andrews and Nick Boyle are now the two primary tight ends for the Ravens. The Ravens are one of those teams that uses tight ends a lot. Uh, tight ends are one of their, their main focus of their offense. So now Mark Andrews and Nick Boyle are the guys there. And Mark Andrews, um, he could have another big season this year. He, he could be more consistent. Last year in fantasy, I know he had some big blow-up games and, and some not-so-good games, but he could see a little bit more consistency, consistency now, especially with uh, Duvernay and Marquise Brown on the outside stretching the field. Just like I said for Prochet, opening things up, it could help Andrews open things up as well. And Nick Boyle actually has a has a decent, not great, but decent profile. He has some speed and athleticism, so he could be solid in this offense too. And if Mark Andrews were to ever get injured or anything, Nick Boyle would step up and be the starting tight end on the Ravens. And in fantasy, we're going to want the starting tight end for an offense like this because it's looking like the Ravens offense is going to be fantastic again next year. Um, I don't know if it can beat how historic the offense was last year, but it's going to be right up there with last year's offense. And lastly, the running backs win too. Just the running back group as a whole. We're going to get into that more later when we talk about losers and stuff for the Ravens. But the running backs do win too because of the offensive line hole plugged. So the offensive line is going to be solid again, and the running backs are going to win with the solid offensive line too. Moving forward with the Cincinnati Bengals winners. So the first winner for the Bengals is Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is likely going to start right away. Um, he's probably going to be the starter. I, I can't see Ryan Finley starting again, uh, the rookie from last year who's now a second-year guy. Um, I, I don't believe they signed any significant veterans to come in and be some sort of bridge quarterback. So Joe Burrow is a huge winner because he gets Jonah Williams back, 2019 first-round offensive tackle from Alabama. The offensive line is going to be improved with him. It's going to be better. They were, they were atrocious last year. So the offensive line should see a slight improvement, which will help Joe Burrow uh, have more time to pass as a rookie. Joe Burrow gets A.J. Green back. Um, he had he got T. Higgins in the draft. T. Higgins stud at Clemson, broke out as a sophomore, as a young sophomore. Had a great junior year this year. He's coming out early. I know a lot of people are, are well, were kind of down on him as the draft got closer and closer. He was kind of the hot name after the college season. And then once we got closer to the combine and the draft, T. Higgins kind of fell off. But T. Higgins was unbelievable at Clemson in the ACC. He did it in a great conference. He played against good teams. He had Justin Ross on his team. He had tough target competition on his own team. And he still produced. He produced at a young age, sophomore, and then had an unbelievable season this year as a junior. And he's big. He has good size. He's not overly fast, but he can definitely win downfield. Uh, he can be that jump ball 50-50 guy most likely and do a lot of big things downfield. And I actually like him a lot in Cincinnati. So Joe Burrow gets him. Joe Burrow gets A.J. Green back. Uh, Joe Burrow has Tyler Boyd, John Ross, and Auden Tate now. So that's a pretty, pretty damn good receiving core there in Cincinnati for Joe Burrow. Um, and he gets an offensive line upgrade as well, which is huge. So Zach Taylor in Cincinnati is, is doing some good things there, trying to give Joe Burrow everything necessary to be successful in the NFL. The next big winner is Joe Mixon. So now Joe Mixon gets that offensive line slight upgrade with Jonah Williams back. And Joe Mixon's going to see much better fantasy numbers this year simply because he's going to be in a better offense. Um, we don't know how good a rookie quarterback is going to be in the NFL next year. It's probably not going to be a, a quick turnaround from the worst team to a good team, but there's definitely going to be improvement there. Um, with an offensive line upgrade, weapons upgrade, I, I don't see it possible that, that, that they don't get a, a lot better, um, a significant amount better. Uh, like I said, they're not going to 
pro- they're probably not going to explode and be one of the most explosive uh, high-scoring teams in the league. But they're definitely going to see a significant improvement this season on the offense. And Joe Mixon will re- reap the re- rewards of that. If your offense is much improved, you're going to be in the red zone more often. You're going to be on the goal line more often, more chances to score. And hopefully Joe Burrow will realize fast that he can check down to Joe Mixon. And Joe Mixon is an unbelievable pass catcher in addition to how good he is at running the ball. And Joe Mixon's probably my favorite guy to draft in fantasy coming up for this season. Um, I'm going to try and grab Joe Mixon everywhere in every draft in every league. Um, he's got a better offensive line now. Slightly, it's going to be it's going to be improved, and now he's going to be in a better offense with a young quarterback. And there's going to be a lot of weapons around. Like in the passing game, all these guys that they have are going to take some of the pressure off Mixon. They're going to take some of the defender focus off Mixon. They're going to take uh, defenders out of the box so Mixon can have more effective runs. And I really think Joe Mixon is going to benefit a ton from this. Next, we have Drew Sample and C.J. Uzoma. So Tyler Eifert is finally gone in Cincinnati. Um, His injuries have driven everyone crazy over the last however many years, and they didn't draft any tight ends this year. So second rounder from last year, Drew Sample, uh, could be the starting tight end this year. Uh, Drew Sample has good size. He's 6'5", 255. And if you actually look at his athletic testing numbers and and look at his athletic profile, his athletic profile actually is very similar to Rob Gronkowski's. Now, Drew Sample had almost no college production. He barely did anything at all in college. He He had extremely abysmal numbers in college. So obviously he's not Rob Gronkowski. That that just the athletic testing looks very similar on paper. So he has athleticism. Um, he has decent athletic testing numbers. And they invested second-round draft capital in him. And when you use that kind of draft capital in somebody, you're, it's going to be hard for the coaches in the front office to not put them on the field because if you don't, if you draft a guy that high and you don't put him on the field, you're going to look silly. So when you invest that kind of draft capital in somebody, um, you're going to have to use them and use them in, their, in your offense. So now that Eifert's gone, Drew Sample, um, he's only entering his second year. Last year he missed, I think, nine games due to a high ankle sprain. So he really didn't even get a chance to prove himself. So second year could be one of the biggest sleeper tight ends in fantasy this year. If you're in some sort of two tight end dynasty league um, or something like that, definitely scoop him up. Drew Sample could be one of the biggest sleeper tight ends. I don't I don't know what his upside is, but if this offense is greatly improved, you can't just only pick and choose some of the weapons that you want. You kind of have to upgrade everybody if the whole offense is going to get an upgrade. So you have to include Drew Sample and CJ Uzoma in there because if this offense is going to be much better. Uh, you and you have the chance to get the starting tight end for that offense. Uh, there could be some fantasy rewards there. I don't know how much, but there could be some fantasy value there. And then CJ Uzoma, who's been there for a few years, hasn't done anything crazy, stepped up, done a few things when all of the other tight ends were hurt on the roster the last couple of years. Um, he has good size and athleticism as well. Um, I think he has a faster 40 than Drew Sample, and they're both about the same size. Uh, They're both around the same size, but Drew Sample has um, a little bit more agility, and his numbers overall are a little bit better than Uzoma. Um, I like Sample a little bit. I I think Sample could be a huge sleeper. Uh, I really do. He could be the starting tight end on this offense, and he's a lot younger than Uzoma. Uzoma's getting up there in age. He's almost 27, 28 years old now, and Drew Sample's young. We haven't really seen a chance to see him do anything even in college we haven't seen him do anything in college but he has a decent decent athletic profile and has the chance to win the starting job so I I think there's value there so next we're going to the Cleveland Browns winners so first winner well these guys go together too for the Cleveland Browns so Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt uh, mostly Nick Chubb but Kareem Hunt is still there Uh, both guys in the running game are going to see a huge increase They bolstered their offensive line, adding Jack Conklin and free agency from Tennessee, and they drafted Jedrick Wills in the first round from Alabama. So now they have two fantastic offensive tackles. 
Uh, they drafted a center from Washington in the fifth round. Um, I'm not sure if he's going to be a starter or not, but they, they invested in the offensive line. Um, the Browns finally realized that you can't win with a bad offensive line. You need blocking. You need to give holes to your running backs. You need to give time for your young quarterback to throw. And I think that's why the Browns were, were so poor last year, is that Baker kind of had no time to throw, and they had such a bad offensive line. Um, they traded one of their all-star guards, uh, Kevin Zeitler, to the Giants, and that kind of hurt them. That, that trade hurt them because they they made their offensive line worse. But finally, this offseason, they've upgraded their offensive line. They have two really good offensive tackles now. And I think this year, if Kareem Hunt doesn't take away too many carries, that Nick Chubb could see a Derrick Henry-like season last year. So if you if you are a fantasy gamer and you've played for the last few years, Derrick Henry has never really done anything that crazy because Tennessee never had a great offensive line. Tennessee never had um, an unbelievable offensive line. And then this year, Tennessee, um, they signed Roger Saffold from the Rams who helped Todd Gurley be one of the best running backs in the league. And when he left for Tennessee, you saw Todd Gurley have a poor season this year in addition to his injury. And now you see the Cleveland Browns upgrading their offensive line. Um, Derrick Henry had one of the best seasons we've ever seen in fantasy last year because the offensive line was so improved. And now you're seeing the same thing in Cleveland. And Nick Chubb could have a Derrick Henry like kind of kind of breakout superstar season. Not necessarily breakout because we already know he's really good, but he could have that kind of superstar season. Um. I think Chubb, Chubb was, I think he finished as the number six running back in PPR last year, and he doesn't really even catch passes that much, but he still has top-tier fantasy value because he could possibly lead the league in rushing, and hopefully he can sprinkle in some passes here and there. And then another huge, huge point for why Chubb and Kareem Hunt could have huge seasons this year is that the Browns added Kevin Stefanski, the old offensive coordinator for the Vikings. He was their OC last year, and we saw the Vikings go from a pass-heavy team to one of the most run-heavy teams in the league. We saw Dalvin Cook's breakout season this year, and we saw them uh, be one of the most run-heavy teams in the league. And now he's in Cleveland, so you're most likely going to see Cleveland become a very run-heavy team. Um, they're going to start running the ball a lot more, and that bodes well for Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. Another big winner for, for the Browns is Baker Mayfield. Um, Odell and Landry are still there. They drafted Donovan Peoples-Jones. Uh, they went out and got Austin Hooper from Atlanta. They still have David Njoku, extremely athletic tight end. And they drafted Harrison Bryant, um, a tight end from Florida Atlantic. He had a good senior season, had 1,000 receiving yards. Um, and they upgraded the offensive line. So Baker Mayfield still has good weapons. He still uh, he still has those guys there, Odell and Landry. They gave him a few new weapons now too. And now the offensive line is going to be extremely upgraded. Like I said in the last episode with uh, Sam Darnold in the AFC East, when you upgrade the offensive line, everybody improves. Quarterbacks have more time to throw. Receivers have more time to get open. Running backs have bigger holes to run through. So the the whole offense is most likely going to get an upgrade this year in Cleveland with a much improved offensive line. Pittsburgh Steelers winners. So Juju and Deontay Johnson are going to be the major winners here going into 2020 um, with Big Ben back. Hopefully Big Ben's healthy. But just, just based on what we've seen from Big Ben throughout his career, he's going to throw, 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 throw. He's not afraid to take shots. So Juju and Deontay Johnson are going to be the big winners as the number one, number two receivers. Um, Eric Ebron and Vance McDonald are likely to get a boost now with Big Ben back, whichever one emerges as the starting tight end and gets most of the passes and most of the targets. And then whatever whoever the starting running back is, most likely James Conner right now, whoever that's going to be uh, will also probably see an upgrade just because the offense is better, there's going to be less focus on the run game and more focus on stopping Big Ben in the passing game, so that'll help the running back as well. Um, the reason James Washington isn't 
a winner we will discuss in the loser column. Um, just a quick general overview. James Washington is going to have to fight rookie Chase Claypool for that kind of outside decoy, uh, deep threat, field stretcher kind of role. And Claypool could steal targets from Washington. So he's not, uh, neither of them are really winners because they're kind of going to fight each other. But Juju and Deontay Johnson's roles are kind of secure. So I, I believe that they're the real winners here. Now, we're going into the losers. So winners are done. We're going to talk about losers for each team now. So going back to the top with the Baltimore Ravens losers, Mark Ingram and Justice Hill are major losers here. Um, they drafted J.K. Dobbins in the second round. J.K. Dobbins, one of the most electric running backs in college football out of Ohio State. Um, he, he's unbelievable. Um, I love J.K. Dobbins. Probably going to draft him in a lot of leagues late this year, and he should be one, one of the top dynasty picks. Um, J.K. Dobbins has great speed. Um, he didn't test at the Combine, but it appears he has great speed on tape, on film. He's done huge things against good teams. He, he's played well against Michigan, Clemson, all those big teams. Um, we've, we've seen he can handle a huge workload. He's had plenty of games with over 30 carries. He can catch. He can do it all. And J.K. Dobbins with this offensive line and this offense with Lamar Jackson could make, honestly, one of the best offenses we've ever seen in football. So Mark Ingram and Justice Hill are, are kind of going to take a hit. Um, you're probably not going to see Dobbins get too many carries right away. And then over the course of the year, you're probably going to see him work in a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then once J.K. Dobbins starts ripping off huge runs in that offense, he's probably going to earn the starting job by the end of the year. And if he doesn't, J.K. Dobbins is still going to be the lead back in the long term. So Ingram and Justice Hill are, are going to be huge losers there as the backfield is likely J.K. Dobbins is for the future. Another loser for the Baltimore Ravens, um, 2019 third rounder Miles Boykin. Um, they brought in Duvernay. They brought in Prochet. Miles Boykin didn't show a lot last year in his rookie season. Um, and the, the Baltimore Ravens had one of the best offensive seasons we've ever seen. And Miles Boykin wasn't really even a part of that. So if you're not going to produce at all, really, in that kind of offensive environment, then it's, it's not looking good for you going forward. So Miles Boykin has a lot of athleticism. His athletic testing numbers are fantastic. But the red flag with Boykin was that he, he was never much, a produ much of a producer at Notre Dame in college. So we don't know how good he is. He's not done yet. He's, he's only going into his second year. He's not done yet, um, but he, he definitely takes a hit here with the addition of Duvernay, who has elite speed, and Prochet, who is a great slot receiver. So if Duvernay and Hollywood Brown are on the outside and Prochet is in the slot, Miles um, Boykin really takes a huge hit. So going into the Bengals losers, Cincinnati Bengals losers, possibly Tyler Boyd, maybe not, possibly. Um, no matter what, Tyler Boyd still has the slot role on lockdown. Um, A.J. Green's going to be starting on the outside. And we don't know whether it's going to be T. Higgins, Justin, or T. Higgins, uh, John Ross, or Auden Tate on the outside. Probably going to be, I think it's going to be Higgins on the outside. They took him with the first pick in the second round. I think A.J. Green and T. Higgins are going to be on the outside. So Tyler Boyd's likely going to see a decrease in overall targets. Last year being the number one without Green, without Higgins. Uh, Boyd was kind of the number one target. But... Now he's going to see less targets, but I do think he still has a ton of fantasy value. Um, just like I talked about earlier with the offense overall improving a ton, there's still value to be had there for Boyd. Um, he's still got his role in the slot. He's probably still going to be the starting slot receiver. So he still has value for sure. He just might see less targets. So he's not necessary, necessarily a huge loser. He might lose slightly. Uh, John Ross and Auden Tate. Huge losers now. Uh, now that T. Higgins is in town, uh, Higgins is a stud out of Clemson. Um, like I said previously, I like Higgins a lot, actually, going into the NFL. He's going to be one of my favorite rookies this year. Um, Ross did do some big things at the beginning of the year last year. He had some huge games. 
and, and then he got hurt again. So I don't know if Ross is going to be able to stay on the field. And now Ross is kind of just most likely going to be a field stretcher, come in every couple plays, run a go route, and, and try and stretch the defense out. And now Auden Tate gets pushed all the way back, so he loses too. Um, John Ross likely isn't going to find himself in three receiver sets anymore, so that hurts him a ton. Cleveland Browns losers going forward. So I, I believe... I believe personally that everybody in the passing game could be a potential loser because of the addition of Kevin Stefanski. Last year in Minnesota, you saw Kirk Cousins' attempts a lot lower, um, and you really saw the emergence of Dalvin Cook because of Kevin Stefanski being hired as the offensive coordinator. Stefanski uh, made them top five, top six in rushing attempts in the NFL, he wants to run, 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 run the ball all day long, let the defense win the games for them. So I, I truly believe personally that the passing game could potentially take a hit here because they're going to run so much. You're going to see less targets for Landry, less targets for Odell, less passing targets overall, and you're most likely going to see the rushing attempts uh, shoot up high in Cleveland this year. So potential everyone in the passing game could be a small loser it's not going to be significant. Um, like I said, the offensive line was upgraded, so Baker's going to have more time to throw. It's it's not going to be some sort of significant loss. It could just be a small, tiny hit because they're going to be so run-heavy now. And David Njoku is a huge loser now because they got um, Austin Hooper from Atlanta. They drafted Harrison Bryant from Florida Atlantic. So now they have two new tight ends. Um, David Njoku really still hasn't improved, or he still hasn't proved himself. He got hurt uh, last year. Um, we were hoping for a huge breakout season, or at least I was last year. I think he had a touchdown in the first week, and then he got hurt for the rest of the year. So I, I still love David Njoku as a fantasy asset, um, more in dynasty leagues. I, I still think he's a good player. He has one of the best athletic profiles for a tight end we've ever seen. He was fantastic in college. He had one of the highest yards per carry for tight ends in college that we've seen. Um, and Joku, athletic, he can make dynamic plays. He can make big things happen. But now I, I really don't see what his role is. And he's, he's likely to be a release candidate or a trade candidate after this season. Um, he's still on his rookie contract, so he's still probably going to be in Cleveland this year. But he really doesn't have any fantasy value this year, I don't think unless Austin Hooper gets injured or something along those lines. So finally, we're going to finish with the Pittsburgh Steelers losers. So a big loser for the Steelers is James Conner. Um, we know James Conner can do some impressive things on the field, but he just couldn't stay healthy last year. Um, he's banged up every, every week. It seems like he had a new injury or he was on the injury report with something else. Um, it, it stinks to see. Uh, he's a good player. He does a lot of great things on the football field. But it, it it's really going to hurt him if he can't stay healthy going forward in his career. And the Steelers went out and drafted running back Anthony McFarland from Maryland in the fourth round. And McFarland runs a 4-4. He's got unbelievable speed. He's fast. He, he's electric. He makes big plays happen. He's got decent size. He's like 205 to 210. He's in the 208 range. I think that's what he, he weighed in at um, at his combine or the pro day. So you got McFarland there now. McFarland was, was not a great pass catcher at Maryland, but his last season this year he did have, I think, 17 passes caught. So McFarland, uh, he, do, he has decent size, and he has the speed to make huge plays happen. He has that 4-4 speed, and I, I think if Connor goes down, you're going to see McFarland start to make some big plays in this offense. And and that is not good for Connor that they, they brought in a running back with great speed like this. And I really think Anthony McFarland could possibly carve out a role uh, by the end of the year if Connor keeps getting injured. You could see McFarland slowly start to take over the backfield and make some big plays. I don't know if he's ever going to command a huge, ginormous workload but you could see McFarland step in and start making some big plays for this offense, especially if Connor gets injured. 
uh, McFarland could possibly end up taking over by the end of the year or as a handcuff whenever James Conner gets injured. So James Conner is, is going to be a huge loser here in fantasy, and I probably won't be drafting any of James Conner at all just because it, it seemed like he had a new injury every single week, and I just don't want that on my fantasy teams. You shouldn't want that on your fantasy teams either. You want stability, and you're probably not going to get that with James Conner. Vance McDonald is also a big loser. Last year, Vance McDonald was going to be one of the biggest sleeper tight ends. Everybody was all over him uh, being a sleeper in fantasy. And then Big Ben got hurt. The whole offense was garbage all year. Um, Vance McDonald this year in 2020, um, it, it's not looking good for him. They brought in Eric Ebron. Eric Ebron probably going to be a uh, more red zone kind of guy, passing threat. And now Vance McDonald's upside um, it's it's kind of gone. His ceiling's gone. Unless Eric Ebron gets injured or something, Vance McDonald's probably going to take a huge hit in fantasy. Um, I don't see him being anything significant. You might see some, some boom weeks somehow. Um, hopefully he still has some sort of connection with Big Ben. But him and Ebron are kind of just going to eat away at each other. Um, you're probably likely going to see Vance McDonald kind of get some receptions down the field. You're going to see him be on the field until they get towards the red zone, and then you're probably going to see Ebron go in and start stealing touchdowns from Vance McDonald. So both of them are kind of going to eat away at each other. You'll see McDonald probably be more of the reception guy, the, the catch reception guy, and Ebron be the touchdown guy. So you, you kind of don't want either of them this year in fantasy. Unless one of them gets hurt and or we start seeing something in the first couple of weeks that one of them's not really – playing that much and the other one's getting a lot of snap share but I don't see that happening they they spent some money on Eric Ebron to bring him in so Ebron's probably going to get most of the red zone work and Vance McDonald his value is definitely a lot lower now and then lastly last loser of the day is James Washington so they brought in Chase Claypool in the second round the Pittsburgh Steelers did and he runs a 4-3 4-4 um, at, at like 245 pounds, which is ridiculous. But if, if you look at Chase Claypool on tape, if you kind of look at the things he does, he's more of just a, I'm going to run straight downfield. I'm going to stretch the defense. I'm going to try and jump over you and catch it. And that's kind of what James Washington did last year. James Washington had like 17 yards per reception last year. Now it's possible that James Washington could have a role with Big Ben back, but I, I don't see it. James Washington and Chase Claypool kind of do the same thing. They, they're going to run straight downfield. They're going to try and stretch the defense out. They're going to try and make big plays down the field. And Claypool and James Washington, they're going to do the same thing that, that uh, Vance McDonald and Ebron are going to do. They're just going to eat away at each other. They're, they're going for the same role. They're competing for the same role in the offense. And Claypool is younger, and they invested significant second-round draft capital in Claypool. So I don't see James Washington really having a role anymore. I see Claypool kind of stepping in and being that downfield uh, field stretcher, kind of decoy threat, red zone threat now instead of James Washington. So I think James Washington takes a huge hit. And I don't, I don't see much uh, fantasy value for Chase Claypool either. Even Especially as a rookie, I don't really see anything major from him. He might make a big play every now and then, but I don't, I don't see anything major from him. Um, unless you start seeing him get on the field more, uh, if Big Ben is good again this year, if he's healthy, if he if he's doing well, um, maybe Claypool or Washington has some sort of role. But I I see them eating away at each other just like McDonald and Ebron. So that's it for the AFC North fantasy winners and losers. Thanks again for listening. Please check out uh, the two episodes from last week. If you missed the, the interview with C.J. Gonzalez or if you missed the fantasy winners and losers from the AFC East division, please go check those out. Thank you for listening. Um, in the future, we will I will have some rookie breakdowns too, um, some rookie landing spots I really liked and some rookie landing spots I didn't like that much. So once I'm done with these in the next few weeks, um, I'll start doing some, some rookie coverage, some rookie landing spots, and talk a lot about that. So thank you very much for listening. If you could give this five stars, uh, leave a rating, subscribe, share it, that would be awesome. Um, you don't understand how much 
uh, giving good ratings and reviews helps the podcast. Actually, it, it helps um, put it more in the popular featured podcast so people can see it easily without having to search the name. It comes up more um, in the kind of the explore page of Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's easier to find for people. And when there's five star ratings and there's good reviews, um, new people that don't know me that are interested in the podcast can look at the reviews and ratings and, and see that it's a great podcast. So thank you very much. Um, this weekend, most likely on Saturday, I'll be dropping an episode with two of my Canadian friends. And we're going to talk about being a Canadian athlete, um, being Canadian born and being an athlete in America and just kind of the kind of the differences. Um, we're going to let them share their experiences, what it's like trying to fit in in a new country, um, trying to fit in in a, in a different culture, in a different style. And I think the format going forward is I'm going to try and have one fantasy podcast on Tuesdays or Wednesdays and then try and have one podcast with a guest talking about something uh, something interesting probably on Saturdays. So that's kind of going to be the rough schedule going forward. Thank you very much for listening and take care.